be a foot shorter than you are, so. Uh, <laughs> as long as it doesn't fall off. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get it situated a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the kind introduction. Uh, go this way. I can't tell you how great it is to be back in Charlotte and outside the Washington, D.C. Beltway. I loved all the years I spent working in the national security sector, but it was all-consuming. I'm now enjoying the opportunity to do new things and to work in other sectors like financial services and energy with my board activities. I particularly appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. When Mike Hawley approached me about speaking to this distinguished group, he suggested I tell my story and what I've learned along the way. That was pretty broad guidance, so I thought I'd focus on three topics. A bit about my personal journey, what that journey has taught me about great leaders, and the importance of successful business and personal transitions. I'm happy to take questions at the end if there's time. Since the last topic, transitions, is the most current and topical for me, I'll start there. My life, like many of yours, has been one of transitions. Marriage, children, moving, divorce, promotions, moving again. But I found none of them more daunting than walking away from the only thing that had been a constant my entire adult life, my corporate career. I hate the word retirement because it sounds so final and makes me think of boredom, sadness, and rocking chairs. Not that I have anything against rocking chairs, but I hate the idea of boredom and sadness and life passing me by. I've been thinking about this time for the last 10 years or so, and early on I decided my transition after the corporate world was not going to be about retiring, just moving on to do something else. I even refused to allow my staff to plan a retirement party. Retirement parties remind me of funerals or memorial services. <laughs> so I opted for a night of drinks out with friends I really cared for. I decided I would take control of the way I exited, even though the company controlled the timing and most everything else. I was adamant I would not become a lame duck after the public announcement. I stayed engaged with the business, increased my public profile, and actively supported the process of finding my successor. Because I planned ahead, I was able to put all of my energy on making an elegant exit and not worrying about what was next. My career had exceeded all of my highest expectations. So I was determined to move on with the pride, passion, strength, and poise I was known for in the corporate world. I found this transition akin to many, and particularly similar to the loss of something or someone important in my life. So I recognized that the process had to play out over time. My departure timing was determined by the board when it became apparent several senior people in the company planned to exit in the same year. Since that was not good corporate governance, our departures had to be staggered. I was the oldest, so I went first. It was announced last August that I would leave the first quarter of 2014. That advance notice gave me a platform to talk about my legacy, gave the media something to write about, and gave me time to get on with my plans. Over those five months, I went through something that reminded me of the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and then acceptance. Having now been through it, I think I would add enthusiasm. Life is good on the other side. I have more control of my life than I've ever had before, and I'm learning new things with my board work and starting my own business. I sleep better at night, not worrying about quarterly earnings, and the well-being of 40,000 people. I'm not always exhausted like I was when traveling 70% of the time and going overseas about twice a month. I'm having fun. The only things I miss are the amazing colleagues I worked with 
the big paycheck, and the company airplane. <laughs> and boy, that was hard, leaving that behind. Uh, managing transitions is critically important in business and life, yet so few people do it well. Change is hard, particularly for type A overachievers like me, who are accustomed to total control. Big transitions inevitably take away that control because of the many external variables in the process. Many of us have seen colleagues retire, wither, and lose their self-confidence and esteem. They turn themselves into victims rather than victors. Others embrace it and see possibilities. The same can be said for big promotions, geographic moves, and life events like marriage, divorce, or the birth of a child. These are all transitions that can be managed if the variables are understood, the controllable processes are planned, and because we can rarely be objective about ourselves, external uh, independent support is sought. In the end, we must all embrace change, not fight it. Acknowledge those things we can't control, and always keep moving forward. The past should leave us with gratitude, not regret, and we should all expect a few curveballs along the way. While it might sound like my corporate exit went perfectly and smoothly, like most of the things in life, it did not. Just when I thought I had made it through all of the emotions and had my plans in place, life threw me my curveball. My last week at work, I began to feel ill, but just knew I had to make it through the week. I had customer transition meetings and a very important speech to give. Somehow I made it through, but by Friday, I never made it to work. I was so sick, I asked if the company plane could fly me to Charlotte. I immediately saw my doctor here, and I was in the hospital on Monday morning. I had contracted a drug-resistant E. coli infection. My kidneys were failing, and I was fighting for my life. Not exactly the way I had planned to start this next phase. I'll spare you the gruesome details, but six weeks later, I was recovered enough to pick up with my plans. The start was a bit late, but my illness made it easier for me to leave the corporate world behind and ensure my priorities were in the right place. In hindsight, it probably made the transition easier, though I would never wish it on anyone else. I could go on and on about the importance of effectively managing transitions, but I wanna move on and talk about how I got here, where I've been, and what I've learned about successful leaders along the way. I am often asked about how I became an engineer at a time when women didn't do that sort of thing. I was born in central Georgia, and as Mike said, grew up in north central Florida in the 50s and 60s, a child of two school teachers who always encouraged curiosity, learning, and self-reliance. I had a brother, and we had little money, but there was a lot of love and a lot of fun. Vacations were usually camping trips, and we frequently traveled the back roads, forests, springs, and beaches of Florida. As Florida's East Coast was the hub of early space exploration, I developed a fascination with all things that flew at a young age. And on a clear day, we could see Cape Canaveral space launches from my front yard. I desperately wanted to fly an unrealistic expectation for a young girl in those times. In the seventh grade, a math teacher introduced me to the concept of engineering, applying math and science to solve real world problems. So I decided if I couldn't fly airplanes, I could design them. I never lost that passion and went on to get a degree in systems engineering at the University of Florida as one of only two women in all of the engineering disciplines in my class. Those incredible years at the university were instrumental in shaping who I am today. As they say, the post-World War II days were the best and the worst of times. The GI Bill had created a well-educated middle class 
and babies were booming. Racism was a scar on our society, but it was largely ignored. Separate but equal was the mantra of the day. I grew up with a strong sense of social justice, having witnessed this massive discrimination in all aspects of society. The days of whites only bathrooms and separate entrances for coloreds. It never made sense to me and my parents always tried to teach us fairness and how racism was wrong. Nonetheless, I was a senior in high school before the schools were integrated in my hometown. In many ways, during my formative years, fear was often in the forefront. I remember being terrified as friends built bomb shelters. We had drills at school, and I watched the troops drive through my town toward the south during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The world was on the brink of nuclear war. Discontent escalated with the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy. It was a violent time marked by civil rights, women rights, and anti-Vietnam War activism. As I grew up surrounded by this volatility, I felt something about me was different from my friends. I was a bit more serious, more determined, and more committed than most to achieve something important and make a difference. I was outraged by discrimination, particularly against women. This was a time when there was still almost no mingling among races, and women were clearly second-class citizens. A woman could not hold credit in her own name. There were no laws against sexual harassment, and it was legal for a bank to ignore a woman's salary because she might get pregnant. It was four years after I graduated from college before the Fair Credit Act was enacted into law. It was many more years before it became unacceptable and illegal to harass women in the workplace. I was a good student in college and quickly overcame the professor's biased views about having a female engineering student. And because it was a troubled time in our country, I became politically active. All of us students in that era believed we could change the world, and in many ways we did. I loved being at the university and demonstrating for causes I believed in. And in the process, I matured into an adult believing I could make a difference. It was a very exciting and stimulating time. People cared and they took action. Entering the workforce was not so positive or exciting. I married right out of college, something I was expected to do and discrimination was rampant and blatant. I learned to channel the humiliation and anger into a determination to succeed. I was not gonna be defeated and was determined to prove to my male colleagues that I deserved to be there. I just focused on doing my job better than it had ever been done before, and that overcame a lot of prejudice. It was an unhappy time for me but I grew ever more resilient each year. It was not until we moved to California that things actually got better. It was a more open and welcoming society than the South. I actually felt like I fit in for the first time as an adult. Life went on. I had a daughter and my career began to take off. I rarely felt burdened by being female from my mid-30s on and my professional reputation was growing rapidly. As my career successes multiplied, my marriage deteriorated. We divorced after 24 years of marriage when my daughter was a senior in high school. As many of you can relate, her teenage years were the most difficult years of my life. We often muse about how we both survived them, but we made it through and are very close today. She's married to an active duty Marine and they have three kids. I love grandparenting. It gives me a chance to do over on mistakes I made with my daughter. You know, I share this brief glimpse of my life because my background shapes who I am, what I value, and how I lead. I am passionate about fairness and particularly committed to promoting the benefits of diversity in life and business. 
As you might expect, the rights of women have always been at the forefront of my agenda. Since almost every job I had was the first time it had been held by a woman, I felt I not only carried the weight of my own success on my shoulders, but that of every woman that might follow me and pursue a non-traditional role. If I failed, perhaps no other woman would be given the opportunity. My recent exit from corporate life finally lifted that significant burden from my shoulders. Having witnessed so much bigotry and hatred masquerading behind social correctness, I developed a passion for people who are honest, transparent, authentic, and straightforward. I believe as human beings we're all in this together and that there is an obligation to help others, particularly those less fortunate. Life became a continuous learning experience for me and I work hard at not becoming a dinosaur. I engage with my university and college that stay connected with young people and the new technologies, and I helped found the Engineering Leadership Institute at the University of Florida. Perhaps it is because of my parents and their passion for teaching that I believe nothing is more important than high quality education. Working in the national security space for 41 years helped me hone an already strong sense of patriotism and pride in being an American. Being able to provide goods and services to the men and women in the military and intelligence agencies instilled a sense of purpose about what I did and why I did it. The products we built and the services we provided saved lives and helped defend our nation. That higher sense of purpose got me out of bed every day, anxious to go to work. As I took on increasingly senior roles, I realized what I liked most about being the boss was the people side of the job. Motivating and inspiring people to do things as a group they never envisioned they could do on their own brought me great joy and satisfaction. I learned to live with the increasing loneliness at the top because I enjoyed being in charge. I'm known for being a clear and decisive leader able to distill complex facts and circumstances into concise direction and actions. I hold people accountable, and there are consequences for both good and bad outcomes. I have a reputation for being very tough, yet people seem to like working for me, and many have followed me from one job to another. I work hard, and I play hard. I'm passionate about things that matter to me, and I believe fun is a critical part of life and work. I've traveled to 35 countries, love to read, friends and family matter deeply to me, and I have many interests outside of work. These very traits and attributes are what I look for in others, though every person and generation implements them in their own unique way. I've learned a lot from the experiences of my 64 years. I've learned to treat people fairly and that everyone matters. We need the janitor every bit as much as we need the engineer and all should be treated with dignity. I learned that hard work is a must, but good judgment and intuition play an important role. I learned to trust my instincts to gather data from others and not be afraid to change my mind. I think time matters, and one must act quickly and decisively in every aspect of work and life. I believe leaders are defined by having the courage to take whatever information is available and make a decision, have the conviction to follow it through, and have the understanding that they and they alone are accountable for the outcome. Employees expect their leaders to collaborate but then act decisively. The worst bosses I've ever had are the ones who struggled to make decisions, leaving the organization to flounder without clear direction or purpose. These lessons are as applicable to public officials and nonprofit leaders as they are to for-profit 
corporations. As I thought best about how to use the knowledge I've gained and share my experiences to benefit others, I decided years ago that I wanted to create a consulting practice called the Cardea Group. I chose the name because Cardea is the Greek goddess of threshold and change. And I believe the ability to adapt, change, and move forward is the most attribute, the most important attribute of continued success. I've transformed companies, cultures, and careers. And I now want to build on my interest in people and how they work and lead. I think the world needs more ethical and effective leaders, the kind of people my grandkids can admire. My colleagues and I build upon our own ideas and experiences to help create better outcomes in life and work for the leaders of today and tomorrow. We're focused on implementing and managing change in leadership, organizations, and strategies to help accelerate success. The world is changing rapidly, and only those companies and leaders able to adapt and embrace that change will succeed and provide the best outcomes for their stakeholders. The way we work, how we work, and where we work are continuously changing with technology cycles and different generational expectations. It is an exciting time to be on the forefront of redefining how we work, live, and lead. Having mentored and coached countless emerging leaders, advised many senior colleagues, and served on four boards, I'd like to close with some thoughts on what it takes personally to be a successful leader in the world today. I believe these principles apply universally. Uh, universally. Any senior leadership role requires that you juggle the interests and needs of many stakeholders. In a public company, these include employees, customers, shareholders, regulators, board members, and media, among others. The style, substance, and approach with one group does not necessarily work with another. In effect, you become a jack of many trades, always on, always responsible. The 24-7 nature of the CEO rule wore heavily on me until I developed a coherent way to understand and cope with all the personas I had to own to meet the needs of others while maintaining an interesting and rewarding personal life. Let me reinforce that I think it is critical to have a healthy, interesting, and exciting personal life. The most successful people I've known have also been well-read, well-traveled, and engaged in interesting and challenging personal activities. I believe in taking time off, and I require my employees to take their vacations. But there is a caveat. You can't just disconnect because your responsibilities don't just go away. This is where I have to say there is no such thing as work-life balance. But there is a way to effectively integrate work and life. Leave it to Beaver was a long time ago. The, those simple days don't exist in this global economy. Different time zones dictate that we must work many hours in many places. But this also allows us to play or take, take time off in as many different hours and places. That is what work-life integration is all about. Being comfortable with moving back and forth between your work and personal lives as required and taking the, mo the, taking the most advantage of both of them. So as I wrestled with the many faceted aspects of success, I learned that I had to have an inside persona, the person that ran the business, managed the people, led the vision and strategy, and made things happen. But I also had to have an outside persona, the person that was the public face of the company, met with customers, represented the company brand, as well as my own, interacted with the media, supported philanthropic initiatives, and lobbied outside stakeholders like Congress and regulators. 
But underpinning and integrating the inside and outside me was the authentic me. The real person with values, hopes, desires, aspirations, family, friends, and personal goals. Once I focused on the skills development and needs of all three of my critical personas, I more effectively managed my life and did not get overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. Helping people hone their own versions of the inside you, outside you, and authentic you is the focus of much of my work today. Before you can effectively lead a business or drive a strategy for business success, you must manage yourself and get the leadership part right. Only then do you have the clarity and sense of purpose to surround yourself with the right people, delegate appropriately, hold people accountable, and provide clear, concise direction forward. I love sports metaphors, so you might think of it this way. A leader establishes the objectives and path forward much like a coach, creates the organization that is the team that makes it happen, and develops the strategy that is the game plan. All are needed to win, but the leader is the linchpin of it all. I now have the one thing I've not ever had before, time to do what I want and what I think is important. I don't have a bucket list. Long ago, I started to do the things I wanted to do in life. My transition objective, <laughs> as I wrapped up my corporate career, was to continue to be productive and impactful as I got older. So far, things are on track, and I feel good about my exit and transition. As I reflect on what has been, I never started out to blaze trails, but I became a trailblazer and opened many doors for women and others with diverse backgrounds. My career was one of first, culminating in being the first woman to ever lead a major aerospace and defense company. That was never about power. Fortune Magazine has called me one of the most powerful women in business. I was just a little girl in Florida who wanted to fly airplanes. And I was fortunate enough to have parents that instilled the confidence and determination in me that I could do anything. I had an engineering education that taught me to think and solve problems quickly. A skill that has served me well in work and life. Even though there were disappointments, tragedies, and volatile times along the way, those tough transitions were where I found out who I really was. Through it all, I've learned to embrace change, constantly evolve, value diversity, cherish family and friends, enjoy work, care deeply about my community and country, share my good fortune, and have fun along the way. I hope these glimpses into my life, observations about leaders, and what I've learned about the importance of embracing change and transitions resonates in some way with you and the challenges you face. At BAE Systems, I created a senior <coughs> leadership program for a few select individuals with the potential to be a senior vice president, COO, or CEO. When they graduated from the program, I always closed my remarks with one final thought from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. He said, and I quote, I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we are moving. We must sail sometimes with the wind and sometimes against it, but we must sail and not drift nor lie at anchor. It is indeed a pleasure to be here today with you and may you all sail on. Thank you very much.